Hi, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update here on social media. Thanks for joining us. We're in the middle of a constitutional crisis, what I call a coup against the President of the United States. Breaking news on that. Big new documents, big new smoking guns, both on the Clinton email scandal and the other part of that coup, which was the Robert Mueller investigation targeting President Trump. You won't believe the astonishing material we have out of the Justice Department. Plus some good news out of California. A court has confirmed that he is, at least for now, shutting down the effort to keep President Trump off the ballot and limiting the choices for millions of Californians for whom they could vote for president. Just a complete attack on our right to vote and frankly the Constitution. So great news there. But first up is the coup attack on President Trump. Now you notice I use the word coup and not impeachment because impeachment uh, uh, suggests constitutionality, a regular process, legality. None of that is present here. As I have highlighted for you, you have this complaint, which in my view is an illegal leak tied up in the bow of a whistleblower complaint, complaint to disguise its dishonesty and uh, the fact that there was a spy operation, again, against President Trump, being used to harass the president with immediate demands for documents without subpoenas, demanding people come forward and be deposed without protections as the law requires. And uh, the speed tells you that it's not legitimate. The lack of due process tells you it's not legitimate. The corruption, evidently, behind the whole whistleblower process tells you it's not legitimate. And so when you tell me that it's impeachment and it's therefore legitimate, I don't buy it. And that's why I call it a coup. We have an abuse of power by the House to remove the president for not a high crime and misdemeanor, but for trying, it looks like, to investigate the corruption that was targeting him over the years and the corruption involving top people in the Obama administration, namely Vice President Biden. It's just out today, or it's just out this week, that Adam Schiff, contrary to his assertions and, and his I would say suggestions to the contrary, was in contact with this CIA operative before he filed the complaint. Why is that important? A, it shows you the partisan nature of what was going on. He contacted the Democratic intelligence staff and Schiff was briefed on it. B, it shows you that Schiff was withholding a material fact from you and lying about it. He was asked if he was in contact with the whistleblower, and he said we weren't. And in other statements, he certainly implied he wasn't. In fact, he was. They came to them. They suggested he do a, uh, get a lawyer and file a complaint. That's how they knew about the complaint. It was a setup. And by communicating directly with Congress, the whistleblower doesn't, isn't a whistleblower because the law doesn't, doesn't allow you to communicate with Congress and gain whistleblower protections. So now you have Schiff, and I, I've, I kind of half-jokingly have said that the complaint was written as if Schiff had written it. Well, I was pretty darn close to the truth, wasn't, wasn't I? Of course, I wasn't the only one who thought that. But now it's confirmed that Schiff was in on this attack on Trump. It's, it's, it's almost exactly like the smear on Kavanaugh. Remember how that happened? You would have thought that this witness came up and, oh my gosh, we got we to gotta, uh, re uh, listen to her. When in fact she had contacted the Democrats who had advised her and worked with her and then they pretended it was an independent witness. There's nothing that leads us to believe here that this is an independent witness against the president. Indeed, the complaint suggests and, sh and admits he has no firsthand information. And they're expecting the president of the United States to start turning over documents to this man, Adam Schiff. Remember, Judicial Watch has two ethics complaints against him, mishandling and classified information and improper communication with anti-Trump witnesses. 
Oh, looks what happened again this time. Communications about the president's communications with foreign officials, any information about it, that would have been classified. His communication with this witness, dishonest communications with the witness, because he didn't tell us about it. If it was no big deal, he should have disclosed it in the beginning. But instead, they needed to get this garbage smear into the, uh, into the bloodstream of public discourse to generate the impeachment push. And this is why they want to move speedily. This is why they don't want the rule of law to prevail and the president to be able to defend himself. If it was a constitutional process, this would come out in a wash. But it's not a constitutional process, it's a coup. And with a coup, you need to attack quickly and surely. And of course, in many ways, it's been a slow motion coup as well, because it began even before he was elected. Or after, actually it began as soon as he was elected, they started trying to undermine him in a seditious conspiracy. I, I, what's hilarious is, I started calling it a coup. I'm not the only one to do that, but I, I think it's fair to say Judicial Watch has shown leadership from the beginning in highlighting this worst, the worst corruption scandal in American history. The president started calling it a coup this week too. So the media has glommed onto the fact that I've been calling it a coup, the president's been calling it a coup, and the New York Times wrote a story that says, with the headline essentially says it's not a coup. Don't worry folks, it's not a coup. What a joke. And they start, they start pretending to cite dictionary definitions of what a coup is and saying this doesn't cover it. Are you kidding me? There's not a good faith, this faith basis for impeachment. There's criminal activity, potentially, behind the communications with Congress, behind the alleged complaints about Trump because they ri arise from improperly obtained material. The phone call itself shows nothing was done wrong. Nothing was inappropriate. And as I said before, and I'll say it again, it is as much about getting Trump, it's not as much about getting Trump as it is protecting them, meaning Democratic Party top people like Joe Biden, like Hillary Clinton from criminal prosecution. And you'll note this week also, they were leaking the fact that the president, as he has said he would do, was communicating with uh, foreign leaders about assisting in Attorney General Barr's investigation into Spygate and whether there were abuses. So you have an ongoing Justice Department investigation with criminal implications that is being obstructed now. So you got this coup at, at, at you got this coup attack, uh, kind of a coordinated obstruction of justice campaign. Don't tell me it ain't a coup. Lawlessness is run amok within the administration in terms of the deep state actors who are acting as promised. You may recall these these uh, not, I, I, there was a not, there was a piece in the new york times late last year or, or about a year ago an anonymous bureaucrat saying there that he's he's out to undermine trump the president's talking about su suing i mean he should think about suing should sue a whole lot of them for what was done to him during Mueller and before then during the campaign and what's being done to him now. You know, guys, this is not an attack on President Trump. Well, obviously it is. But it's also an attack on you. You're, you're, if you're a citizen or you seek the protection of the United States Constitution, they're trying to tear that apart. Our republic is at stake. And you see more evident deep state corruption. You have the ICIG. I've warned you about inspector generals, haven't I? 
They're usually there to make sure that unpopular people are targeted. If you're a real whistleblower, the last thing you do is you go to the IG. Because IGs, in my view, are often used to target whistleblowers. This guy wasn't a whistleblower or gal. I don't know who he is. But it's, and, and, and of course, he or she, no, it was a group. And they don't want you to know who this person is. They don't want you to know who this person worked with. But they're expecting the President of the United States to turn material over to the compromised Mr. Schiff to answer allegations, demonstrably false allegations, because the complaint mischaracterizes the underlying information it purports to complain about, na a, namely the transcript and key facts about what went on. Spends a lot of time quoting anti-Trump news articles about Mr. Trump. And the president is expected to answer these anonymous accusations in some sort of star chamber-like proceeding? No way, Jose. Uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, objected to this outrageous attack on the State Department. He alleged that the Democrats were calling staffers up, telling them not to hire lawyers. You can't cooperate with that criminality, that lawlessness. They don't want to freeze the president. They don't want him to talk to his attorney general. They don't want him to talk to the secretary of state. They don't want him to talk to foreign leaders. It is a coup. And you can call it impeachment if you want, but it's an abuse of the impeachment power. And those promoting it uh, should be held accountable. And frankly, they should hear from you. And anyone who, uh, and, and I tell you, looking at the, the weak defense of our Constitution and the president, the left has gone nuclear. And the, so those who would be defenders of the rule of law and you know, the Republicans on the Hill, they seem to be still looking for their car keys. Judicial Watch stepped up with a lawsuit against the State Department for the documents on Biden's corruption in the Ukraine, the firing of that prosecutor that was looking into his son at, after Biden pressured them to withhold, uh, pressured them by threatening to withhold a billion dollars. If it were a regular impeachment inquiry, the president could say, I want to bring Biden in as a witness. I want to bring Hunter Biden in as a witness. Hey, I may want to talk to Adam Schiff. I want to talk to this whistleblower. I want to talk to who he talked to. Another thing I suggest the president do is to file a criminal complaint or to direct the attorney general, because he is president after all, to do a criminal investigation about how this complaint came about. Because I said, because it, it necessarily relies on classified information and violates his right keep his communications with foreign leaders confidential, or the specifics of them. So uh, call your members of Congress, call your senators at 202-225-3121. That's 202-225-3121. Put down what you're doing and make the call. Write an email, write a letter, R send a postcard. Go to the post office, they have postcards there. Your members need to hear from you. Your representatives need to hear from you. Write a letter to the editor. Be active online. Learn about the information Judicial Watch is telling you here today. We have some of the first-hand information, and obviously we've been tracking what's been going on very carefully. So you can follow us online on Twitter and Facebook, etc. Go look at our videos on our YouTube site. I mean, you'll see my interviews. I talk extensively about this, not only on our YouTube channel, I was on Fox News talking about it. Get the word out. Our republic's at stake. You know, and, and I, t I tell you, uh, these documents we just have, I mean, show you 
just how awful things have been for this president. I'm surprised, you know, uh, it's a testament to him personally that he's been able to kind of push through these attacks on him and do the basics of his job. Because I think there would, be other, there would be other people who would have resigned rather than deal with this. I mean, this, story, this new document shows that Rod Rosenstein or sent an email to Robert Mueller saying the boss doesn't know about their communications. This is before he was appointed. So Rod Rosenstein was secretly communicating with Mueller without any, the quote, boss knowing it. Who was the boss? Was it Sessions at the time? Was it the president? He also sent another email. to someone in the outside. This is, this is classic. I think he appointed him the day, before, the day after this email was sent. I am with Mueller. He shares my views. Duty calls. Sometimes the moment chooses us. What on earth does that mean other than he and Mueller are anti-Trumpers? How would you interpret that? I read it to you. How would you interpret it? That's what I love about what Judicial Watch does. We get the emails. You can see them. I interpret this to mean that they're anti-Trumpers. And he's having secret communications with Mueller, keeping him away from his boss. They also show, and these documents, again, we had sued for these documents as part of our investigation into, what's the name of that movie, The Seven Days in May? There were these, this period in May of 2017 uh, during which Comey was fired and then they appointed the special counsel. And in between, there were these coup discussions that Judicial Watch through this law, because we wanted to know what was going on because we found out through leaks that they had discussed wearing a wire in the president in the Oval Office, invoking the 25th Amendment lawlessly to try to remove him and appointing a special counsel all as part of the coup discussions. And of course, the only thing they did specifically that we know about is that Mueller was appointed. So just remember, Mueller was appointed as rising from discussions about how to remove the president from office, both lawlessly, well, all lawlessly in my view. And of course, all of that was precipitated by James Comey stealing Trump's FBI files and leaking them to the media. Crime on top of crime led to Mueller's appointment as part of an effort to remove him from office. Dare I say it, coup-like activity. So we had sued for these documents. No one else is asking for them. You've got the Attorney General of the United States for the practical purposes, acting Attorney General, acting FBI Director, talking about targeting Trump with a wire in the Oval Office. We've got the memo. I talked about it with you. Andrew McCabe wrote it. And the memo makes it clear Rosenstein wasn't being sarcastic. And certainly we have other documents showing they talked about the 25th Amendment. Now we have the shady communications with Mueller. They also show that Rosenstein had cozy relationships with the anti-Trump media, talking to the New York Times directly, talking to 60 Minutes directly, talking to the Washington Post directly, and they are cheerleading him on. Rosenstein writes his friend in the Washington Post, Sari Horowitz. I don't know, literally they're friends, but this is a friendly email. At some point, I owe you a long story, Rosenstein writes, but this is not the right time for me to talk anyone, anyway, uh, to talk to to talk to anybody. Horowitz had written, now I see why you couldn't talk today, which implies he's talked to him before. Obviously, we're writing a big story about this. Is there any chance I could talk to you on background about your decision? Why would he communicate with him? Or I, I'm not sure sorry is a woman or a male, a woman or, or, or uh, a male or female name. Listen to the 60 Minutes communication. Catherine Davis, 60 Minutes producer. Good call on Mueller, although I obviously thought you'd be great at leading the investigation, too. He 
So the Deputy Attorney General of the United States is talking to the media, getting cheered on by the anti-Trump media, talking to Mueller secretly without, quote, the boss knowing about it. Why did they need to keep it secret from the boss? And who is the boss? And what does he mean that he shares Mueller's views? Mueller is a never Trumper. Mueller doesn't like President Trump. Otherwise, why would he have abused his office to target him so lawlessly for two years? Judicial Watch got this, folks. Not Congress, not the media. It wasn't disclosed voluntarily by the Justice Department. We had to go into federal court. Well, I don't know when we went in, but we asked for the document a year ago. We asked for this material a year ago. We're only getting it. A few, oh, this is the final production a few days ago. And we obviously didn't get everything we asked for, so there will be more fighting there. But uh, isn't, this, isn't this astonishing material? It, it confirms the dishonest corruption behind Rosenstein's appointment of Mueller. It shows this cozy relationship between Rosenstein and the media. Do you think it's appropriate for the number two of the Justice Department to be working hand in glove with the media, even on so-called innocent stories? Because he was confirming basic facts, which to me shows that he had a, a long-standing relationship with these folks. He was a go-to source for them. So if you want to know who was leaking, we got it. On top of that, we get this new document from Justice Department and State Department. They've been withholding this e Clinton email for years, hiding it. Why? Because it confirms the Clinton email cover-up. It's an email that had been sent. Uh, essentially, the email reads, uh, it's a report on WikiLeaks. And the, the report is redacted heavily. And it's sent to Hillary Clinton and top officials at the State Department. Someone else forwards it on and um, includes Mrs. Clinton's private email address that she was misusing for government business. And Daniel Baer, who is an Obama State Department Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, writes to Posner, who uh, had forwarded this email on with Hillary Clinton's email. Baer writes, be careful. You just gave the Secretary's personal email address to a bunch of folks. Posner answers, should I say don't forward? Did you notice? Yeah, I just know that she guards it pretty closely. What does this show? It shows the State Department knew Hillary Clinton was using her email, her non-governmental email, to conduct government business. It shows that Hillary Clinton didn't want many people to know about the fact that she was doing this. It also shows that the State Department covered it up. Why does it show the State Department covered it up? Because they refused to give it to us, even though they knew they had it. We found out about it only as a result of discovery just recently given to us by a federal court judge. You may recall last December, Judge Royce Lamberth granted us discovery in a Benghazi case that covers Hillary's emails that the government, the State Department and Obama and Justice Department tried to get us to shut down before they had to fess up on the emails. The judge was furious. He said, I want to know whether Hillary Clinton was trying to avoid FOIA, whether or not you were trying to game the court by shutting this uh, case down so, so that you didn't have to produce the emails, and where the other emails might be, the ones she deleted or otherwise are out there. And in the course of the discovery he granted to us, a top official at the State Department or a former top records official at the State Department testified that he reviewed it in late 2013 and 14. Did you hear that? 2013 and 14. They knew six years ago, at least, of course it goes back further than that, that Hillary Clinton was using government email, uh, uh, personal email for government business. And they weren't telling anyone about it. They were hiding it. 
This wasn't produced to Judicial Watch. Actually, it was produced to Judicial Watch. It was produced to us previously in a redacted form that hid Hillary Clinton's email, that A, that she had received it, and the specifics that she didn't want it shared with anyone. They hid it from us. It's a cover-up. And we pushed them to give us the complete email that the witness testified about because the court told us just a few weeks ago we can get it. And they were still playing games with us. And they only gave it to us after our lawyers threatened to go to court to compel its release. So the Justice Department and State Department were still trying to cover up from Hillary for Hillary Clinton as recently as 10 days ago. And the Justice Department, you want to know why the Justice Department isn't prosecuting Hillary Clinton? They're too busy defending her. And it's not too late to reopen the criminal investigation of what Hillary Clinton did. Judicial Watch has the evidence. People say, does the Justice Department know? Of course they know. They give us the evidence. So where do things stand now? The court is, uh, we're in the middle of writing a brief responding to Hillary Clinton's opposition to our motion to depose her. Well, essentially, we have asked the court for permission to depose her. The court has already granted us additional discovery because of big fines like this. And Hillary Clinton, while she's out there joking around about her emails, her lawyers are in court trying to tell the court, don't let Judicial Watch question her under oath with the support of the Justice Department. They didn't want us asking any additional questions. Same goes for Cheryl Mills, her chief of staff, then the lawyer involved in helping delete the emails once she left office. We wanted to depose her again. So uh, I presume the court will rule in the next month or two. So the Hillary Clinton email scandal continues. And unlike Congress, which is covering up for her, unlike the Justice Department, which is covering up for her, and the State Department, which is covering up for her, and of course, protecting themselves. There was news this week that the State Department IG, I think, has sent letters around to people who had been using her email account both directly and indirectly because they were sending classified information improperly to her and um, using the wrong accounts to send classified information, unsecured accounts. And of course, they're all up in arms thinking it's a plot by Trump to resurrect the Clinton email issue. The outrage is they're only doing this seven years after the fact. And my guess is they're doing it in response to the federal court judge who was furious at the State Department's cover-up. And he excoriated both the State Department and Justice Department for it. Not only under the Obama administration, but under the current administration. So things are moving on the Clinton email front because of Judicial Watch leadership. No wonder they want to talk about innocent phone calls to Ukraine. We have documents showing a coup attack on President Trump out of the Justice Department and the FBI, a spy operation against him. You have Attorney General Barr daring to ask questions about the spying on Trump generally, I don't think there will be any prosecutions, but still they're very nervous about it. That's why they're talking about Ukraine, folks. New York Times called me um, asking me about why I'm calling it a coup. And I said, well, maybe the New York Times will finally cover the email, the memo that we have with Andrew McCabe talking to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States about wearing a wire on the President in the Oval Office. Doesn't that sound like a coup to you? And removing him under the 25th Amendment. Doesn't that sound like a coup to you? And now they're having impeachment slash non-impeachment to railroad the President out of office. I, uh, you know what? I'm going to stand up against it. Judicial Watch is going to sue to find out what's really going on. And I don't care what the media thinks about it. I don't care what the so-called experts think about it. I know what the documents are. 
We've been litigating this. Everything we know virtually, or too much of what we know, is because of our litigation on this. And I don't care if a member of Congress doesn't call it a coup or the leadership gets nervous about it. I don't care about that. Because I'm going to call it the way I see it. And I don't use words like that lightly. I don't think I started calling it a coup until late last year. I've been talking about the criminality of the seditious attack on Trump for some time. But I didn't start using the word coup until it became quite evident what was going on. Maybe I even waited too long to call it a coup. Well, we have some good news. Actually, it's great news, because it, it is part of the coup attack on Trump. This lawlessness, this attack on our constitutional republic, which is comprehensive. They're attacking our Congress. Remember, they tried to overturn the Senate through riot, intimidation, and violence to stop Kavanaugh from being appointed. And then they re-engineered the smears against Kavanaugh to attack the court and intimidate him and threaten him with impeachment. And of course, they've always been trying to impeach the president, and they being the left, the lunatic left, the authoritarian, totalitarian left, undermining our border, destroying our sovereignty, and they erupt again in California trying to keep President Trump off the ballot through a lawless unconstitutional requirement, as documented by a federal court judge, requiring that he issue, uh, put out his tax returns. Now, if you believe the liberal media, you would think everyone releases the tax returns who's running for president. And in fact, the law requires it. That's not the case. Not every presidential candidate or president has released their tax returns. I can see why people will be interested in President Trump's tax returns, but the law doesn't require us to force, his, uh, the, the force out this private information. So California, in order to try to get Trump, issued this, uh, created this law or passed this law, and Judicial Watch sued to stop it on behalf of voters whose rights were being attacked. The media would have you believe this is Donald Trump that's at issue here. And that's only partly true. It's our Constitution that is at issue here. And it's the voters who are at issue here. It's their right to choose that is at issue here. Versus the deep state coming in and telling us who can be president and who can't be. And if they don't like the president, they're going to destroy him and remove him through illegal means. So the latest iteration of that is this California, ballot, this California ballot requirement. And I told you it was either last week or the week before that we won. The court, the court ruled from the bench that he was going to grant a preliminary injunction. Uh, Judicial Watch was there. Our attorney, Russ Nobile, was there representing our clients. Uh, there were other lawyers there representing their clients. And, uh, and of course, the president's lawyer was there. And the court's written decision just came out this week, and it ruled, uh, and because uh, you, know, you always get a preliminary, you got a preliminary ruling from the court, but you know, unless it's written, you never really know. Well, we got this written decision, and it is great. It is 24 pages, and it's written by Judge Englund, who's a longtime jurist there on the bench in California. And he found that this provision violates the Constitution four ways. And I want you to read, I'm going to read something. I may have read this before, but it's worth highlighting. Governor Brown, the former liberal Democratic governor of California, had vetoed this, an earlier iteration of this law. And this is what Governor Brown said. The court quotes Governor Brown. The bill is in response to President Trump's refusal to release his returns during the last election. While I recognize the political attractiveness even the merits of getting President Trump's tax returns. I worry about the political perils of individual states seeking to regulate presidential elections in this manner. First, it may not be constitutional. Second, it sets a slippery slope, slope precedent. Today we require tax returns, but what would be next? Five years of health records, a certified birth certificate, high school report cards, 
And will these requirements vary depending on which political party is in power? Governor Brown is right. But Gavin Newsom came in and passed this and signed on to this unconstitutional bill. And the court ruled it's unconstitutional in a, in a really powerful, dramatic way. He writes, furthermore, from a practical perspective, allowing individual states to potentially adopt disparate and inconsistent qualifications for presidential primary candidates tramples the framers' vision of having uniform standards for the qualifications of those individuals running for president. Because the president, I mean, the court notes that the Constitution sets out what the qualifications are for president. Very limited. There's a residency requirement. You have to be a natural born citizen. And, um, and what's the other requirement? Oh, you have to be 35 years old. So uh, the court, obviously the states can't add to that. Only that can be added to, there's a way to add to those requirements, by the way. It's by amending the Constitution. And, uh, and the court found that our clients especially were being harmed. And this is, this is important because this goes to what your interests in are in, in the rule of law on this case. He found that the public had, quote, extraordinary interest in ensuring that individual voters may associate, associate for the investment of political beliefs and cast a vote for their preferred candidate for president. You have a right to vote for the president of your choice, and no one can unconstitutionally thwart that. It was an attack on the, on the integrity of our elections. They were trying to game the elections for 2020. And leftist California politicians, again, in their zeal to attack President Trump, passed this blatantly unconstitutional bill. And the court, as I said, found it was unconstitutional six ways to Sunday. And what's going to happen next? The leftist mob running California right now. And it's a, this, is, this is kind of mob action. They don't care what the rule of law is. They're just going to do what they think they can get away with. They're going to appeal it and waste more money. And I, cause I, this, this, is, this case is going to be thrown out. We're going to win at great time and expense and waste the taxpayer money, but we're going to win. And uh, so it's something to highlight and raise up because we have now a positive court ruling upholding the rule of law against an unconstitutional attack directed at the president that would take away the right to vote for President Trump or other candidates of their choice to tens of millions of American citizens. So good news. So I will be back next week with the Judicial Watch update. Remember what I told you to do. Contact your members of Congress about the coup slash impeachment assault on President Trump. Support Judicial Watch. Get the word out about the information we have. And you be personally active to try to protect the republic. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week here on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update. Judicial Watch is in federal court right now battling deep state bureaucrats who want to impose their own agenda behind closed doors and in secrecy. Judicial Watch wants to protect the rule of law and the Constitution. Follow Judicial Watch on YouTube.